Okay, so I think we're going. So we're about to start a program for today. Um, I have the honor of uh, introducing today's speaker. Uh, he serves as associate director at uh, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago. He receives his PhD in Media Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, his dissertation was a case study on Huda TV, which is an English language Islamic satellite television station based in Cairo. In addition to doing field work there, he was also the station's program presenter and producer. Uh, he's also published in several periodicals, one of which is the Journal of Arab and Muslim Media Research. And most importantly, he is also a professor here at American Islamic College, where he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in media and Islam. Please give your warm welcome to Dr. Thomas McGuire. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you everybody for coming out. <clears throat> uh, so today I want to talk about um, kind of the the general idea of the presentation um, and the, <clears throat> the title, maybe perhaps slightly intriguing title. Uh, then I'm going to talk in some detail about the research that I've done to sort of uh, provide some answers to this big, bigger issue of new media and Islam. And then really um, end with some questions <coughs> about, uh, you know, just for consideration about the significance of uh, what I'm calling big dawa, which is more or less the, the sort of later, latest um, uh, iteration of kind of new media and Islam. So, so there's a tendency in, uh, in uh, sort of the general humanities and social science fields uh, for Muslims who are working in, in academia there's a, a temptation and sort of maybe a, a feeling of a, um, a, a necessity sometimes to, to do what might be called the Islamicization of theory or the Islamicization of knowledge. Um, and within my field of media studies, um, this is something that's been done by a variety of scholars. And the basic a dilemma that is trying to answer is the sensation of doing scholarly work or academic work, but feeling as a Muslim that perhaps the terms of the debate have not been formed um, you know, on your terms, in your image, uh, with your perspective in mind. And so one of the ways that um, that process is addressed is to try to link some of the terminology, some of the classic Islamic terminology, um, to the sort of the, the scholarly practice or to, to kind of the, the body of theory itself. And so some of the media scholars who have done this in various ways uh, I have listed here. And usually this takes the form of, of again, um, kind of highlighting a particular terminology in Islamic history, something like Ummah, Ijtihad, Tawheed, Ijma, Shura, Dawah, which I'm talking about today, um, and sort of attaching it to the analysis of a, particularly, a particular contemporary practice. And very often this, this is kind of a, a, a good intention but a failed effort that um, you know, it's taking things out of context, it's very hard to sort of transfer religious terminology onto a particular situation. Uh, one scholar who I think conceptualized a way of sort of Muslims doing social science in a, in a bit more sophisticated manner is Tariq Ramadan, in his book Western Muslims in the Future of Islam, argued that the social sciences have a greater proximity to the core of religious thought because the scope for interpretation, subjectivity, and ideological orientation is considerable our particular view of the world may, it may influence work in these sciences. And in this description, uh, Tariq Ramadan is essentially recognizing that there is this kind of area of tension between the social sciences and the religious sciences, because and sometimes they, they sort of lay claim to the same ground, and they may presume a certain kind of ethical framework. So using his, his, uh, his kind of idea as a launching point, um, I take as my own perspective and I sort of reappropriate the term Islamism uh, as, as essentially the theoretical project or the sort of academic project that, uh, you know, that, that, that I situate myself within and that I think a lot of Muslim academics and Muslim uh, thinkers would find themselves. 
I define Islamism as the, the body of thought and associated political, social, and cultural activism that seeks an authentic and effective application of Islam in today's world. Now, of course, what authentic, what uh, effective uh, means, what the particular contexts are, are all subject to a great deal of debate. But what is important is understanding that this kind of Islamic project in the contemporary world um, has kind of a tension between continuity of tradition and what is often a sort of unprecedented and complicated context as crucial elements, and also a desire to assert kind of a radical singularity of Islam, you know, still maintaining that Islam is the truth with a capital T, at the same time as recognizing kind of uh, uh, a, a pluralism that exists within the world, within the tradition ex itself. And a lot of our, I, I would say, Islamic kind of contemporary discourse sort of falls within this broad definition that I, I use to describe Islamism. So in my dissertation, I describe my own project as critical Islam, <coughs> uh, essentially, um, you know, as kind of the jumping off point of, of, of putting myself within this body of work. So let me move to the, the, the topic of the lecture in a way, the, the, the title of Big Dawah. Okay, so um, the, the, the title Big Dawah is actually a play on the term big data, which is a contemporary way of understanding uh, media and new media and the sort of proliferation, abundance of both information um, and the ability to kind of access and analyze, uh, synthesize that information. So this is a very uh, you know, common term we hear nowadays, so I'm sort of attaching uh, this, this term of dawa to that. Instead of big data, we have big dawa. And in that, I'm asking essentially whether we have kind of a radically different uh, communication practice emerging among Muslims. So this is something that, again, going back to this idea of using Islamic terminology and academic analysis, uh, it's something that's often fraught with um, sort of inconsistency or incoherence in a lot of ways. An example might be uh, the way this, the, the use of the term ijtihad is thrown around. So ijtihad, for instance, is a term that is really referring to kind of uh, uh, sort of sophisticated legal reasoning. It's used most often in kind of a legal context. And yet in popular and sometimes academic context, it's kind of thrown out to mean anything from critical thinking to sort of the, you know, the rationalization of, of uh, reformation. Or it, it has sort of a, a, almost it's stretched to kind of a, kind of a meaningless point. So my, my criteria for using a term like this in academic analysis as dawah um, is something that is kind of recognized within the Islamic literature as a social ideal. So not something that has necessarily a particular technical meaning, but something that is kind of embodied within the, the Islamic literature as a social ideal, but also something that is used within the social context itself. So the term dawah, and here I have just one ayah that, that kind of references dawah, um, meaning, you know, invitation or communication, preaching, so on, is something that's actually used by Muslims who are making media. So it's something that within the social context itself, the rationalization that Muslims are using when they're doing uh, blogs or TV shows or, or websites or whatever it is, the media activism that Muslims are doing, dawah, has historically been kind of a part of that conceptualization, and it's certainly part of the, the conceptualization of the work that I've done uh, and the, the, the research that I've done. So dawah is this kind of organizing principle in Islamic media. So moving from that kind of uh, framework of thinking about dawah, I'm going to give kind of a history of new, of new media as we understand it, how, as we study it, uh, what that term kind of means, uh, and then look again, look specifically at my own research and, and sort of plotting different areas of this process. So when we talk about new media, we're really talking really about <coughs> Uh, kind of almost a 20-year process or over 20-year process that, that sort of tracks with the emergence of the internet and with digitization. <coughs> so in kind of the classic sense of, of uh, media history, we have this kind of bigger mass media, which is recognized as newspapers, televisions, uh, television, film, um, media that is generally not accessible to kind of ordinary people that has a very uh, dichotomous relationship between a limited number of producers and a huge number of consumers who are, who are actively using the media. Um, and then we have kind of a small media, which is the, the um, you know, could be things like, and again, we're talking about 20 years ago, so I recognize that some of this isn't part of your current media reality, but cassette tapes, 
pamphlets, uh, various kinds of community media. And if you think about sort of Islam and the Muslim world, how our, our, our own media might have fallen between these areas um, in the past. Uh, in, in America and in, in parts of the West, the Muslim media would have really only been in the category of small media. So you would have gone to a, a conference maybe and bought cassette tapes and lectures. Uh, you might have had local, maybe local newspapers or some kind of limited circulation newspapers. Uh, you might have a company like Sound Vision that's doing kind of independent media production, but kind of limited distribution networks for that production. Uh, but in the Muslim world, of course, you would have had uh, the whole variety, the whole span of, of media. So you would have, um, you know, Islamic-oriented uh, newspapers. You have uh, television networks, usually in the past, that were somehow connected to state broadcasting, or at least were state-sanctioned. Um, again, we're talking about, about 20 years ago and, and, and beyond. Uh, some, some film, some television programming that has kind of an Islamic orientation. But then you would also have the kind of small media which in, in the Muslim world created quite a bit of social change. So for instance, in the, uh, the uh, uh, revolution in Iran, um, the cassette tape is often credited as being sort of one of the major factors that was able to kind of spread the revolutionary message uh, you know, in the late 70s uh, by you know, cassette tapes being distributed and uh, passed around. The same thing occurred in Saudi Arabia uh, in, the, in the 80s and uh, early 90s where cassette tapes became kind of an alternative medium. Um, but what happens in the mid-90s is this process of, of internet or digitization starts to exert kind of a gravitational pull on both things we consider big or mass media and kind of the small media. And these, these, these boundaries between mass media and smaller community media start to blur and start to change. And there's kind of a, you know, an associated social process and social change that's going along with that. So that's essentially the context of, of, of my own research that I've done over the years. So if you look at new media and Islam, you have um, you know, certain qualities that are, that are going on. You have a decentralizing or recentralizing of authority. So as I mentioned, in, in you know, pre-1995, say if you had an Islamic television show, uh, it was probably at some level sanctioned by the state authorities in various Muslim countries. Um, in many cases, maybe it did not go beyond the boundaries of that country, that, that uh, you know, it was, it was confined to kind of a national broadcasting system. Uh, if you had other projects that were going on, they were connected either to a particular organization or a particular community leadership that had the resources to develop media. But you had sort of a more uh, set center of power of how these things were produced. Well, with new media, you start to get that to kind of this decentering and recentering of authority. You also start to have the emergence of new voices. So people who might not have had access to the media in the past, or perhaps they had access to the small community media, the cassette tapes, start to have access to mass media. And you start to see, again, new voices kind of emerge into a diversifying media system. You also have new networks emerge, new intersections in communication. So like I said, where in the past where you had kind of national broadcasting, you start to see more regional broadcasting. You start to see with the internet media that can easily cross borders. Um, <coughs> one of the great you know, sort of phenomena of, of, of you know, globalization really is the ability, or the, lack, the, the government's losing the ability to control the information that flows uh, through and sort of within their borders. Uh, and that's a quality that you see with new media and Islam as well. And then you start to also see a hybridization of identity, of faith, of activism, where um, you know, all kinds of sort of new areas of Muslim expression are emerging, new perspectives are emerging. And this is a process that has generally been taking place over the past 20 years. Uh, and I would say probably within the last seven or eight years has intensified in very unique ways. Um, the assessment that we often hear in this process uh, is often quite dramatic. So uh, the, the, many of the academics who wrote about this maybe 15 years ago when it was just emerging as kind of new media, these are often sort of non-Muslim academics who are studying the Muslim world, uh, often talked about, about this kind of new media leading to an Islamic reformation or sort of a, a democratization of knowledge within Islam, an erosion of, of authority, an erosion of the traditional authorities. So this is a perspective that kind of presumes that 
the traditional authorities in Islam or the traditional scholars in Islam are somehow in kind of an adversarial relationship with people, and this new media is just going to sort of break that bond and open up things entirely. Um, and then you also hear a critique maybe more from within the Muslim community about how the new media and the new voices and sort of um, the, the access that anyone can have to the, the, the potentially global stage of media leads to a destruction of tradition or kind of a, what I'm saying is a populist apocalypse. <coughs> I mean, that you just have you know, uh, all kinds of voices um, clamoring for attention and, and asserting things about Islam and there's no you know, basis for it or foundation for it. And these are kind of the extremes of the critique of what's going on. So when I was doing my research originally about uh, kind of the early 2000s and started to encounter particularly the academic literature that, that seemed almost to be celebrating uh, the, the pending collapse of authority or scholarship in the Muslim world, um, I found that uh, you know, what was actually going on didn't, didn't quite map onto that neatly. So some of the trends were visible, but that there was a little bit more to it. So for the next few minutes, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the research I did first within uh, kind of early Islamic internet or Islamic websites. Uh, and then I'll look a little bit more specifically at, at, the, at the work I did for my PhD dissertation, which was working at an Islamic satellite TV channel. So again, these are both examples of this kind of, um, what I call the gravitational pull of digital media, kind of shaking up the, 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 way, the ways that things work. So you'll see kind of a trend of change going on, and that's what I hope to illustrate. So this era of kind of Islamic internet, what I'm calling 1.0, 2.0, uh, which is a distinction that some scholars make between the, the internet as kind of a, uh, a medium of dissemination versus the internet being a medium of participation. So the internet 2.0 is kind of when, when uh, more active and accessible sort of interfaces for participation start to occur. That's something that we all recognize with social media, for instance, or with blogging, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But the idea that anyone can just open their phone up and actively participate in some kind of media discussion or, or, or sort of mediated discussion that people can broadcast their thoughts on Twitter or social media or whatever it is. This is something that, you know, 10 years ago maybe didn't exist or maybe you had to have some level of technical knowledge to be able to access that kind of communication platform. But in the early days, uh, you know, a lot of the, the Islamic websites were just somebody who had technical ability who became one of the kind of new actors and was able to sort of become an, an editor of, it, of Islamic content for the world through the, through, through, uh, through the internet. Um, but then also you still had a lot, of the, a lot of kind of ties to traditional centers of authority or traditional organizations. And so in my own work I looked at a variety of, of websites, some of which are still around, some of which are gone, but representing I'd say a, a wide variety of perspectives within kind of broadly defined Sunni Islam. Uh, Islam Online, which was connected to Yusuf Qaradawi, um, Asahwa, which is kind of an independently produced site in the UK that was uh, a little bit more connected to kind of the opposition of uh, sort of opposition scholars in Saudi Arabia, uh, Sunni Path, which was more of a kind of Sufi traditionalist site, uh, Salafi Publications, which is kind of a, a very active uh, media uh, platform uh, that was that would that advocated certain scholars maybe more connected to the Saudi regime, and Azam.com, which at the time was kind of one of the jihadi uh, websites. Um, and so some of the trends that I noticed across this, this ideological spectrum is that, yes, there were kind of a, a, a new and transforming, transforming elements to media. There were new kind of uh, new set of players, these, these individuals were able to serve as kind of the new editors of Islamic knowledge. Uh, and there, were, there was greater participation and interaction. So for instance, many of these sites started to develop discussion forums, which were kind of the precursor to, uh, to social media that we have today. Um, and yet those, those uh, platforms were not necessarily widespread. They still kind of represented, in many cases, closed communities. They were not connected to a broader public or a broader uh, environment of media. Um, and there was very clearly a persistence of authority. So not just that uh, figures of authority or scholars or ulama could, could exert some influence or were able to communicate their message, but the people who were actively participating in this media still considered authority to be kind of the primary currency. So even though there was a lot more participation and a decentering of sort of media production with a lot of people participating in, in the process of media, 
there was still very much a concern among this, these usually groups of young Muslims doing this with the idea of authority. So that wasn't something that was just going to vanish or disappear, as some of the scholars had, had indicated. Um, and as I said, yet there were kind of limited intersections. So these groups were not operating necessarily on the same platform. They were operating in independent individuals, kind of segregated websites and discussion forums. Those were not necessarily reaching a, a broader public or you know, accessible by a broader public. And that's something that would change uh, later with the introduction of social media. So let me talk a little bit about Huda TV, which is where um, I, I, I worked for about a year, and I also did the field work for my dissertation. So Huda TV is an English language Islamic satellite channel. Uh, this is the picture of a set <coughs> where we used to do a program called Ask Huda, which was a live call-in, uh, basically a fatwa program, so people asking questions about Islamic law. Uh, I was the host of that program for basically the first year of broadcasting, and I always appeared with a, an expert or scholar who would answer the questions. Um, but Huda TV represented, again, a legitimately kind of new framework within this kind of emerging digital media. So um, some of the qualities that it had, first of all, it was operating in Egyptian Media Production City, which was a new facility built on the outskirts of Cairo that allowed a lot of these new, um, uh, basically provided production facilities for a lot of these new satellite television channels that were emerging at the time. As I said before, in the past, uh, television broadcasting in particular was something that was strictly controlled by governments because it was seen as part of the kind of national identity. When the, in the late 90s, you started to have the emergence of satellite television in the Middle East, and by the early 2000s, you really had an explosion of kind of new channels popping up. And Huda TV was an example of that. So Huda TV represented a, a legitimately kind of new uh, media entity that would not have existed 10 years prior, but was enabled by this kind of new digital media environment. Uh, Huda TV had also the kind of hybridity, or the, what I'm describing as the intersection of, of forces and elements. Uh, it was owned essentially uh, uh, and, and sort of had central management in Saudi Arabia. It was basically funded at the time by private donations of individuals in Saudi. Again, all of this operating under a, a rubric of dawah. So again, we're still with, we're very much within the framework of dawah as kind of a, a critical concept, but also as a concept that mobilizes Muslims who are engaged in this kind of activity. The orientation of the channel is something that I would call uh, cosmopolitan Salafism, so uh, probably more identifiable with kind of a, a, a Salafi and, and at least some elements of kind of Saudi religious uh, life, but at the same time being um, kind of more inclusive than, uh, than maybe some of the more um, official uh, articulations of kind of Saudi religious establishment, um, and also you know making kind of conscious efforts to be sort of within a Muslim context, um, ecumenical to a certain degree and inclusive. Uh, it was done in the English <coughs> language, so Huda TV was an English language channel, still is an English language channel. Uh, and there was a, a, a unique assemblage of staff to make the channel, uh, to make the channel exist. So you had sort of the Saudi capital, you had an Egyptian kind of cheap labor environment for, for a lot of the, the production staff. But you also had this unique role played by Western Muslims, both as the staff, as I, I myself participated in, but also as the religious experts that came through the program and produced the shows, um, as kind of the people who had the cultural authority to be able to communicate this Islamic message within the English language. Um, and all of that created kind of a new and legitimate hybridity that, that would not have existed um, in the past. So just to give you some indication of the kind of programs that uh, occurred at Huda TV. Um, again, Huda TV defined itself as an Islamic station. The idea of dawah was, there, was very much part of the work of the channel. Uh, programs might include invocations, which was essentially a, a sort of short fillers to kind of teach um, dua uh, from, from hadith and kind of uh, invocations that Muslims could learn. Ask Huda, the, the program that I hosted, which was a live call-in fatwa program. Hajj Step by Step uh, was another program I hosted, which um, was essentially a, an instruction, kind of a video instruction manual for making Hajj. Uh, at one point, it was actually shown on Saudi Airlines for people flying to, to Hajj, so I, people would come back and tell me that they learned how to do Hajj from my show uh, while they were on their way, on their way there. Um, Untold Stories of World History, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, which is a show hosted by Abdul Hakim Quick about um, sort of Islamic history, but kind of outside of the, the, the kind of core narrative that we often hear. 
uh, and Perspectives, which is another show that I hosted, which was essentially a live uh, call-in program which focused on a lot of contemporary issues. And it also was probably one of the programs that was, was most um, inclusive and also stretched the channel's mission beyond <coughs> kind of strictly religious content. So for instance, I hosted, I once interviewed someone from the, the World Health Organization about the sort of bird flu scare um, that was going on at the time. Uh, I interviewed several kind of diplomats. Uh, I interviewed a German journalist. Uh, I interviewed a, a Turkish journalist from the Gulen movement who was, who was in, uh, in Cairo. So it was, a, it was that show in particular was kind of stretching the, the definition of the channel. Um, just to give you some kind of technical background on my research, uh, the, the, basic, the basic question that I was asking is how does Huda TV assert an Islamic presence in the satellite television arena? Um, and this was a case study, meaning that I'm, I'm not really trying to come up with kind of generalizable laws or uh, even necessarily trends about Islamic satellite television, but I'm looking at a very detailed case uh, of one Islamic satellite channel to kind of uncover some of the interesting phenomena that are happening there. Uh, the title of my dissertation, A Light in Every Home, was actually a reference to the, the channel's slogan. So the, the, so the slogan of Huda TV was A Light in Every Home, which was referencing the hadith that Islam would sort of enter every home, and this was a means that it would do so. Again, very much connected with the, with the idea of da'wah. Um, the questions that I asked, the major questions that I asked in my work, first is how does Huda TV uh, how do Huda TV's production processes and programming help to conceptualize Islamic satellite television? How does Huda TV assert Islamic identity among and against dominant global discourses? How is Huda TV's Islamic mission impacted by its cultural and political economic context? So um, again, looking at sort of recognizing that there's an Islamic, or what I would call from the beginning, Islamist project going on here, but then looking at the particular ways that that actually uh, comes to life in context and the various factors influencing it. So this kind of interplay of hybridity and authenticity that I identified as being part of um, you know, the, 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 the new media landscape um, is something that was you know, very much evident at, in Huda TV. As I mentioned, there's kind of a, a nexus of the Egyptian production context, Saudi uh, uh, capital, and then uh, very often American faces or voices presenting the, mes the, the, the message of the channel. This in itself is a very novel ar arrangement. Um, but then in the programming of the channel, there are two areas that, that I'll talk a little bit more in detail about. One is kind of various responses to <coughs> modernity, or what I would term the um, ideas that may be seen to compete with Islam for kind of ultimate either epistemological or ethical authority. So um, specifically looking at issues like human rights or modern science and things that may be seen, to, seen as kind of the esteemed discourses in the world and how this channel operating on a, on a global stage could kind of align Islam or respond to some of those other discourses. Uh, but there were also various cultural lenses that came into the channel, and this is drawing, these terminology is drawn on the work of Sherman Jackson, uh, who talked about, uh, in his work Islam and the Black American, kind of two frameworks within American communities of, of sort of applying Islam within cultural context, one being post-colonial Islam, which is essentially Muslims coming from a post-colonial context, uh, and, and framing Islam in that, in that manner. And then the black religion of black American Islam, which is a sort of more indigenous Islam, uh, deeply concerned with issues of social justice and equality that come out of the black American tradition. So all of these, these forces and activities and, 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 uh, and sort of agendas are present in this channel as kind of you know, new digital media. Um, so let me give you a little bit of, of detail about that. Um, looking more specifically at this issue of kind of the African-American staff and scholars who are presenting on the show and the sort of authority um, accorded to them within this context, you see, um, you see kind of a blending of, of what I would define as two factors. One is what Sherman Jackson calls kind of the third resurrection or the, the reconciling of orthodoxy with, with culture and history and with this kind of ongoing mission of, of, uh, of social justice. Or another way to say it is social justice being kind of a measure of legitimacy for any articulation of, of, of black American Islam. And also what, what uh, the scholar Stefan Kwa called uh, uh, um, kind of Islamic field in Saudi Arabia, referencing sort of a, a non-official um, dis religious discourse that's often referred to as the Sahwa. So essentially kind of a, uh, like I say, sort of a cosmopolitan Salafism rooted in Saudi Arabia that informed a lot of the channel's identity. 
Uh, and then so that essentially a lot of what was going on at the channel was kind of an articulation or reconciliation of these two factors and these two forces within this medium of satellite uh, television. So uh, I'll give you some examples just from the first, uh, the, the first um, uh, from some of the programs on the channel. So there was a program we did called Sermons from the Holy Land. Um, and this is an example of kind of uh, the, what, I, what I call the major sources of religious authority. So we have the, 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 the chutbahs that are offered on a weekly basis from Mecca and Medina, from the, 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 the Masajid in Mecca and Medina. Um, and those are being translated and then broadcast into uh, on Huda TV. So the, 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 the gentleman who was in charge of this process uh, was an African-American Muslim from New York who coined a term that he called translotion. Uh, and translotion essentially was the idea that a translation had taken place that was given to us for the, for the recording of this, of this chutbah, but that it required an additional process called translotion, which essentially was essentially described as uh, the trans translation had been done, but it needed to be smoothed out, and so we needed to put some lotion on it. And so that was the idea of translotion. Um, but the, 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 the term translation, it's, uh, in, in addition to applying to this specific context or project of translating chutbahs and kind of making them uh, more culturally acceptable or more uh, palatable maybe to the English-speaking audience, was also emblematic of the American Muslims' role at the channel. So there was a very conscious idea that the American Muslims had the ability to sort of bring to life the... Can we just wait for questions after? No. To sort of bring to life the... Um, the the, the religious mission of the channel in a way that could reach its audiences more effectively. Um, and in that process, you, you actually see kind of um, certain critiques maybe even of, the, of the, the channel's kind of religious mission or the broader religious context in which it's operating. Uh, you see this kind of lens of social justice, the black American Islam becoming uh, a sort of a major factor with which the, the channel's message is being communicated. Um, and you also see kind of an appeal to cultural authenticity. Uh, this was just something in the production environment that the, that the gentleman who, who ran this program would always talk about the, the last poets but had less, uh, less kind of uh, admiration for more contemporary hip-hop music, so which, which may, may have grown out of that. So um, that was one example. Another example, Untold Stories of World History. Again, this is a show presented by Abdul Hakim Quick. Um, this is an example, again, of how... Uh, a, a scholar whose work had probably 10 years prior to that been available on cassette tapes at you know, the ISNA convention or in a, in, a, in a catalog within the American Muslim community um, is now sort of being given a global stage uh, to, produ to produce some of the same kind of work in, a, in sort of a, you know, a slick TV production environment. And so we did 13 episodes on untold stories of world history looking at issues like Islam in Spain, Islam in West Africa, uh, East Africa, um, traces of Islamic contact in the New World or in Europe um, in sort of uh, centuries prior to sort of European expansion. Um, and this is, for, for those of you who know the scholar Bill Hakim Quick, this is kind of a very recognizable part of his work. Uh, but in the production of this program and in sort of the according of authority to this scholar to convey the channel's message, there's also um, a lot of, you could say, even kind of subversion going on or reorienting the message of the channel. So, for instance, um, the, 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 the strategies for combating what you might call Islamophobia, one of the, the examples that Abdul Hakim Quick used was to talk about slave revolts that occurred in, in the New World uh, by Muslim slaves, um, and how some of those slave revolts were conceptualized under the, the rubric of jihad. Uh, so, basically taking this concept that had been so, so much used to kind of malign uh, Islam and sort of you know paint, paint Muslims as extremists was being then sort of reattached to kind of <coughs> what would mostly be considered one of the most defensible forms of kind of uh, righteous violence, which would be the slave rebellion. Um, and so, sort of by reorienting that kind of debate and that kind of terminology, uh, it has a much kind of greater effect with the intended audiences. And again, that's an instance of this kind of Black American Islamic perspective being articulated. Um, also taking, also taking uh, a view into history and looking at things like racism and sort of ethnic chauvinism that existed in various types, of, various times in history and how that was part of the decline of various Muslim communities. And then very explicitly connecting that to the current state of the Muslim world and saying that, you know, maybe some of these same, pop, same, some of these same uh, phenomena are occurring now. So um, 
So again, this is identifying kind of racism as something that is a, uh, an endemic problem in this Muslim world. That certainly would, would have not been part of the, uh, necessarily the agenda of the owners of the channel or the production uh, staff of the channel, but, but through this particular scholar's ability to kind of operate on this global stage, that perspective of Islam is now given sort of a new voice. Um, I kind of uh, go through this quickly, but one of the other areas that we examined was um, uh, on a program called Health in Islam. And this is kind of shifting gears, but again, talking about those discourses or ideas that some may see, see to compete with Islam for kind of ultimate, what I say, ultimate epistemological, meaning like sort of our, our knowledge about the world or ethical authority. And so, and so uh, you know, medical science, modern science is something that's very esteemed, uh, certainly in the Egyptian context. And it's also something that's part of a lot of kind of Dawah literature this idea that Islam and science are compatible. And so when the, the program Health in Islam that we were producing was first conceived, the goal articulated by a senior manager from the Riyadh office set the criterion for the program's success as the ability to integrate the religious and scientific messages. And the basic components of this, uh, this program were um, guests on the, who were essentially Egyptian doctors, uh, who, who, want, who were described by one local channel executive as the cream of Egyptian society. Uh, so these are like sort of very esteemed medical professionals in Egypt. And then an American program staff and an American host to the show um, who were going to kind of, again, help to sort of push the, to try to achieve this connection between sort of the, the, uh, the religious and the scientific uh, discourses. Here are some of the, um, the texts that uh, probably many of you are familiar with that have often been used kind of as part of this, this particular approach to Dawa, um, looking at the connections between science and Islam. Um, but what happened in this ch channel was kind of an interesting phenomenon because you had the, the Egyptian Muslims, who, the doctors who were the experts on the program, very often they were, were keen to mention that they had American professional certifications um, and, and members of, kind of boards of medicine in the U.S. And they were very keen to connect all of their discussions to evidence-based medicine. Um, whereas you had an American host and an American program staff that were probably a little bit more ambivalent towards medical authority, um, probably had more of a sort of a postmodern orientation towards uh, science and a little bit more open to the ideas of alternative medicine. And were also keen to emphasize this idea of prophetic medicine, which again is something that um, you'll see kind of mentioned in some of these the, the texts that deal with this issue. So uh, one way I, I, uh, I described this was you had sort of the AMA Muslims, the American Medical Association Muslims, and then you have the Whole Foods Muslims uh, who have the kind of the alternative medical approach. So you're already seeing kind of a bit of conflict in perspectives emerging within this, what's supposedly a very um, uh, sort of natural connection between these issues. But essentially what, what happened on this uh, program is that you have doctors uh, being asked to kind of align their expertise with what is called prophetic medicine or, prof or medicine that's essentially drawn from the Quran and Hadith. Um, and the doctors engaging in a variety of strategies to sort of determine how they would, how they would do so or what, what, they would be, what would be considered acceptable. So the, the approach to this idea of pro prophetic medicine ranged from everything from quiet acceptance to rejection. Um, and was also all, often filtered through kind of professional representation, uh, reputation. So uh, some of the strategies that were, that were included, the, ge the general idea of Islamic, kind of Islamic science existing before modernity and, and Muslims having kind of some of the, uh, being sort of the carriers of science or the initiators of certain scientific disciplines was something that was sort of generally accepted and celebrated by all of the participants in the show. There's also a, a category of topics that you could say are, uh, have sort of evidence-based compatibility. So you have smoking, which becomes sort of, uh, you know, there becomes kind of legal consensus around the prohibition of smoking in the modern era. And of course, that aligns with modern medicine. You also have, uh, uh, you know, sort of the damaging effects of alcohol and some of the beneficial effects of honey, which is mentioned in the Quran as having healing properties, the both of which had been demonstrated within evidence-based medicine. So those were kind of eagerly endorsed. But there were also what I would call epistemological limits. So areas where uh, something mentioned in the Quran or Hadith about medicine does not actually uh, have demonstrated compatibility with evidence-based medicine. And in this case, uh, the doctors had various strategies in terms of how they were 
going to sort of segregate themselves from that kind of, um, that kind of uh, knowledge. And the, probably the main example of this, the key example of this, is the practice of hijama, which is uh, cupping, which is a, a traditional medical practice, something that there are sort of abundant hadith referencing, but is, is something that, that modern, certainly the modern medical establishment in Egypt uh, rejected entirely. And not only rejected as a medical practice, but would have seen as kind of an indicator of backwardness. So the doctors were very eager to kind of avoid uh, touching on, discussing, or endorsing this. Some would, some off, sort of off camera would mention that the practice of hijama is something that they've seen work, but they don't have any framework within evidence-based medicine to talk about it, so therefore they could not talk about it. And ultimately, there was a program uh, presented on hijama, but it was done by someone chained, uh, trained in Chinese medicine, which has its own sort of practice of cupping, uh, and it was actually demonstrated on air. Um, so. Um, so that, again, this is an example of something where you have sort of an idea of dawa, you have a collision of all these various social forces and individuals which under other circumstances probably would not have met, certainly would not have met within kind of this mass media environment. Um, and you're starting to see kind of a, you know, the, 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 the foundation shake a little bit of that overall project. So if we look at the trajectory of new media, we can see demonstrated within the examples that I've mentioned that there certainly are greater hybridities and intersections you see this gravitational pull of digitization where different forces and ideas and individuals are being brought together through media and their expression is being broadcast uh, you know, to the world. Um, you see also at the same time, however, that there's still kind of an institutional control of the message. So even with kind of limited subversion of message through the example of like untold stories of world history that I mentioned, you still have a very strong kind of center of communication. You have you know, the, the production facilities that are, that are owned and controlled. Uh, you have the ability to censor material. You still have a lot of sort of the old media qualities evident within this new media. And while you do see some new voices being broadcast, those are also limited. So there's, there's certainly limits put on the discussion and the ability to limit discourse and discussion. So in this sense, Dawa, um, again, going back to that original concept and thinking about how certain Islamic concepts can fit into to social analysis and social theory. You can still see Dawah as kind of a, an organizing framework for the channel, and you also see it as um, a kind of a, a relative coherence within the channel's message, even though you're starting to see some dramatic changes with new media. So um, I'll just finish by basically asking a few questions about what I'm calling the era of big Dawah, which is uh, something that has developed over the like, last probably seven, eight years maybe the last 10 years. Um, first of all, with blogging. So blogging represents a, a, a significant change because not only are new voices emerging, <coughs> but you have kind of individuals able to gain kind of mass following in a manner that was not previously accessible. And blogging also represents one of the first instances where you have a really kind of a user-friendly interface of, of communication where people can interact and, and, and discuss and, and self-publish. And so you start to see um, you start to see a lot of new voices emerging within this context. Uh, you do see scholars are active, but now they're sort of forming, they're sort of positioning themselves within these new networks of communication. From about 2008 on, you see the development of social media, where you have Muslim media moved from kind of not, not just organized projects, but ubiquitous activity. So for instance, everybody in here who's on Facebook or has Twitter uh, or Instagram is producing and exchanging media all the time. Everyone who is sharing uh, news items or sharing videos and commenting on the videos of others, this kind of media activity has become ubiquitous. It's also much easier for people to make their own videos or make their own material and to share it. So the, the, what, what might have been in the past been a kind of a, a conscious project of media making, like Huda TV or the, blog, or the blogs or the earlier discussion forums, in the era of social media, you start to see a ubiquity of media practice, which is you know, significantly different. You also have participants multiply, so almost everybody is participating in media now, whereas in the past there were maybe a few who were producing and, and maybe many who were consuming, but the level of participation is not much greater. Um, you start to see activists, or even kind of like self-styled media figures, occupy uh, a similar status to the way that scholars might have been regarded in, in uh, past efforts <coughs> in Islamic media. So, um, and 
you know, some of, some of those people may in fact be scholars who are sort of prominent figures within this, but you can think of somebody like Suhaib Webb, who was very active with media in this era as it expanded. Um, some of Yasser Qadi, some of these scholars who have been very active within media, but also many other new activists who have emerged, who have a media presence, who are talking about religion and talking about Islam, but are doing so within kind of a very different framework and with kind of their own following. Um, you also see the collapse of Muslim media as an independent space. So, whereas in the past you had maybe Islamic websites or discussion forums that were managed by Muslims, that were sort of content was controlled, now you have Muslims interacting on broader platforms like Facebook or Twitter, where essentially the boundaries between kind of Muslim producers or Muslim uh, you know, media producers and consumers and non-Muslims is completely vanished. So if you, if you simply index a, a tweet or a video with you know, hashtag Islam, you're suddenly part of a conversation with you know, anybody in the world who is similarly uh, tagging or hashtagging um, their content. And then so what this creates is what I'm calling a collision of dawah and anti-dawah. So uh, if you can consider the classic kind of genre of Islamic communication, Islamic media, as a project of dawah, um, anti-dawah is kind of the, you know, the negative stereotypes in the media and the various projects to kind of defame Islam and the, the, you know, the videos that are occasionally sent out trying to uh, defame the Prophet Sallallahu or other kinds of efforts like this. You suddenly see all of these kind of projects occupying the same space and colliding in a much more dramatic fashion. So the question I just want to end with is, does, does the word dawah still apply? Do we have now with contemporary media and this big dawah that I'm calling it, is there actually a conceptual break from what media did in the past uh, and, and how Muslims used media in the past and the function that it served within Muslim, Muslim communities? Do, do Islamic media function as projects of education, communication, and proselytizing in the way that they might have organized production in the past, or do they represent something entirely different? Um, does big dawah represent a novel social force in Muslim communities? So are we seeing, uh, with kind of new media practices and an entirely new um, kind of undertaking by Muslims and how they communicate? Um, and then we could probably talk for hours about sort of the utopian and dystopian qualities of new media, but we're identifying racism in Muslim communities. These are things that have been really enabled by this new big dawah um, uh, kind of activism within media. But then you also see things like the rise of uh, the, the sort of ease with which um, you know, recruitment is done for radical groups like ISIS and uh, sort of the proliferation of claims of authority in very sort of unprecedented and alarming ways. Um, and so it's, it's very much kind of undetermined what this all means. So with that, I'll conclude, and uh, I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McGuire, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we're going to open it up uh, to questions. Uh, we're just going to limit one question per person, and please try to keep it short and succinct. We're running out of time. So, yes. Please. What I had wanted to add while you were speaking, give us some example of uh, translotion. Like, what was it before it was lotioned, and what did it say afterwards? Because that was very theoretical, and I would like to hear something real. Okay. Um, let me think if I can come up with a good example. Um, there might be some, okay, let me, there might be, a, 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 I, I remember there was a, a phrase that came through in one of the translations that referred to the killing freedom of the West. Okay, so it was it was kind of a um, a rather coarse condemnation of sort of Western values that were seen as infringing upon Muslim societies, right? So so the killing freedom, which is in itself is an awkward phrase. I mean, it needs linguistically a little bit of adjustment, but it's also sort of the, maybe. The, the harshness of it. Yeah. Well, we also would usually have the Arabic too, so it was. Uh, I mean, we, we would able to sometimes reference it, but we. Um, we changed it to something like, um, you know, false or hypocritical claims to embodying freedom or something like that. So that we're we're sort of softening the critique, but also making it a little bit more uh, pointed in terms of the, the sort of hypocrisy maybe of, of. And this is being you know this is being written. No, I would find that was a total uh, change. Well. Um, some of it might have been a total change, actually, but in that case, I think it was in the context of the Iraq War, and so the, the idea that 
you know, freedom was this the, sort of the banner of freedom was being used to justify the Iraq War. So, um, you know, for someone very <laughs> proximate to the sort of the the mass carnage of that event, to call it sort of the killing freedom, might have been an I think accurate. That should not have been smoothed out. Well, uh, I think. I mean, I would I would argue also that it, it makes the it connects the the speaker and the the hearer or the the audience more effectively. So, okay. you know. more questions? Yes. Yeah, just real quickly, your, uh, give me your feedback on Alchemia. What's that? Alchemia. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You haven't heard of Alchemia? No. Okay, it's a new, uh, anyone in here heard of Alchemia? Yes, no? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's a nice, uh, if you go home and, like, Google Alchemia or Google it on your phone, mm -hmm. it's a very nice, um, it's like an Islamic, uh, it's a website, and you get a subscription, and it's it, you get access to films, art, uh, science, lectures. Um, yeah, you should you should look it up. Okay. How do you spell it? How do you spell it? It's alchemy, and then alchemy. Yeah. Alchemy. A, yeah, like alchemy, but alchemy. Yeah. Is it is it is this the thing they market as like the Muslim Netflix or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. Okay, we're going to take you. Excuse me. We had to appropriate onion. Do not prefer. Does dollar still apply? Yeah. Were you using uh, from theory to application to show the, the, the viewers that some of the terminology is what's harming Islam today? The, the very word jihad. That's that's a beautiful platform to explain to the public the true meaning of that word and why you have the radicalization what's going on throughout the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, me and some guys, we're going to get together and do some documentaries to try to bring to light the, the falseness to the reality of what this mountain is about. Because Dhamma will that, that apply until the day of uh, judgment. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that. And I, I think um, the distinction I'm trying to make is in, in doing that kind of program with the channel, I mean, Dawa is part of the, the organizing framework of everything that's being done and everything that's being conceived in that, in that sense. <clears throat> what I'm asking is the way that kind of religion figures into the, the newer era, the sort of big Dawa era or newer media, um, does it have that same kind of, you know, does it have that same kind of natural application to all of the activities that Muslims are doing? So there's, it's not that the term Dawa will cease to, to mean anything or that, there aren't projects that would be called Dawa, but is um, is this kind of phenomenon of new media has it has it changed to a point of representing something entirely different or breaking down the old analytical frameworks essentially? Any more questions? Does, does the Dawa talk about <coughs> the ISIS and because they are claiming they are the Muslim, the uh, they claiming that, but I think that that way should explain, especially to the worker, <coughs> and that these people and all what they are saying, they are Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. They are not really Muslim, but they are, I don't know what your opinion is. Is it part of Islam, or really they are not Muslim? Well, I, because I think, like uh, I said, everything the, they are saying is like, destroying like I said, Islam. Yeah, I think it's one of the, the, the sort of dystopian examples. I mean, one, one of the, the, the sort of, I guess, the alarming aspects of the whole sort of ISIS propaganda machine is how how proximate they can get, how close they can get, in the sense that they're active on Twitter and other forms of social media. I was just I just saw somebody post on Facebook today that his son is watching a, some Islamic cartoon or something like that on YouTube, and then like a ISIS recruitment video pops up. So uh, I mean I certainly don't think it, they're, that they're that they're valid or they represent a valid approach in any way, um, but. Their sort of their ability to kind of kind of use media effectively and, and connect with people on an interpersonal level and recruit on an interpersonal level, I think, is what in general people find so alarming, whether it's Muslims or security people or whatever it is. And so, um, so again, the question is, yeah, that would be kind of a maybe a perverted project of Dawa, but then the question I would ask is, like, what is it about? The, the nature of new media that makes that so compelling, or what, what allows it to be so effective, you know, and and uh, and, and have such reach. So, yeah, well, I was expecting to declare or make more programs to say these are really not because many 
Christians here, they are asking, these are the really Muslims, not you are Muslims. Because look at them, they kill another one person and say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And look at them, they are praying. You see one of the short ones yeah. who was praying and later on he killed somebody. <coughs> and well, I mean, the, the, the thing ones. is, we're never... We're never we need to explain to the West and to everybody, these are not really Yeah, Muslims. sure. I mean, I, but I, I think people are also doing that, you know, explaining that till they're blue in the face. And I mean, the fact is that a lot of what, what's being applied to Muslims now is just kind of good old-fashioned bigotry. So when you have that kind of logic operating, you'll always be able to, you know, perform collective judgment. You know, any bad behavior is going to be applied to the group because you're a bigot. You know, so like that, that kind of mentality, it's hard to, um, it's not necessarily going to be defeated. But obviously, yeah, you want to have, you want to have a more, uh, you know, positive da da dawah to counteract those kind of projects. I, you know, I fully agree with that. Well, uh, we got time for one more question. I think that uh, I was saying, uh, listen to what he's saying, I think that it's the absence, absence of uh, the examples of the prophet. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, the Muslims is, is not really tuned in on following the examples of the prophet. And if they follow the examples of the prophet, because the prophet did not work in that kind of frame of mindset, you know. So if they follow the examples of the prophet, you know, it would be a whole different situation. Yeah, that's interesting. I heard somebody describe this once as that some of these groups, um, they're, they're, not they're not following the sunnah of the prophet, but they're trying to follow the seerah. So they're trying to, like, reenact history, you know, in, in, a, in a totally different context. And so they read about, you know, a battle or something that occurred during the life of the prophet, and they feel like they have to, to live that. You know, they have to relive everything, as opposed to looking at the sunnah as kind of a life example. So that might be one way to conceptualize it. Okay, and with that, we'll conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this insightful talk. Thank you. Let's take a picture with this, maybe, as a token of our appreciation. Actually, he's not guest. He's our professor here. We are proud of him. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Have a good night.